Hello and good morning. Welcome to episode four of Innovation Factory. My name is Prith Banerjee. I am CTO at ANSYS. So uh, today what I'm going to do is to uh, discuss innovation in large companies. And uh, I'm going to start with a quick personal background and then uh, interview a CEO of a large company, Brad Feldman. Uh, in fact, I have interviewed him for in chapter four in my book, and he has provided a lot of very, very good insights. And then discuss the innovation problem that large companies face. And then uh, provide a very quick introductory business basics of innovation, how companies use R&D investment to drive innovation across a wide range of products and divisions. And so that ties in with how large companies manage large portfolio of R&D. And then how companies actually, uh, as they are innovating, they're coming up with new ideas. They need to protect you know, innovation through patents. I'm going to end my discussion with how large companies can create a culture of innovation with some programs to support innovation. So let's begin. So uh, as I mentioned in the first episode, I've been fortunate to have worked in innovation in various scenarios. Uh, I spent my first 22 years in innovation in an academic setting at the University of Illinois and Northwestern. And as I covered in the last uh, episode, I talked about my innovation in startups. But today, it's all about the experience I got in managing innovation in some large companies. Uh, for our five years, I had the opportunity to work as director of HP Labs. And then during 2012 and 13, I was group CTO at ABB, a large power and automation company. I was based in Zurich in Switzerland. And then I was global managing director of R&D at Accenture for a couple of years. I was then EVP and group CTO of Schneider Electric, a large power and automation company headquartered in France. And then for the last uh, four years, I've been a CTO at ANSYS, uh, a large engineering modeling and simulation company. And during this time, I have been, uh, I've acted as a board member of two large uh, public companies, Cray and Cubic, and a private company, Turntide. And I've also have uh, been on some technical advisory boards of various companies. So I've got some perspectives of how innovation happens in large companies, which is what I want to share in this episode. But uh, before I begin, I kind of uh, wanted to share the fact that it's not just my own personal insights, but the insights of a CEO, uh, Brad Feldman, who I have interviewed in my book in, I kind of talk about <clears throat> it in chapter four of my book on Innovation Factory. And Brad is a very, very good friend of mine. He was uh, president and CEO of Cubic from 2014 to 21. Uh, I was fortunate to have worked with him for about three years when I was on the board of Cray. And uh, Brad oversaw operations of Cubic's two divisions, the Cubic Transportation Systems Division and the Cubic Missions and Performance uh, Solutions Divisions. He's a graduate of Stanford uh, Graduate Institute. He has an MBA from San Jose, San Diego State University and a BS uh, Electrical Engineering from the US uh, Air Force Academy. So during a really, really exciting interview that I share in my chapter, uh, chapter four, I asked Brad about some of his, the core technologies that uh, Cubic was investing in, how they are investing in innovation, what is the percentage of R&D uh, that he, the Cubic invested, right? And, and how much of it was internal R&D, how much was customer funded R&D. So you'll see in my book where he kind of talks about the, the, the way he was driving innovation. And then we went into a great discussion about how as a CEO, is responsible for growing top line revenue growth and bottom line savings to generate more earnings and driving share price. So in fact, some of these uh, uh, insights I'm going to share today in this, uh, in this episode. And then as a CEO of a company, right, how he invested in R&D to drive profitable growth in businesses and essentially how did he manage a portfolio of R&D investments? I'm going to share those insights in my, this particular episode. And then he kind of talked about some of the programs he had uh, called Idea Spark, 
where he fostered Horizon 3 innovation at QVIC. Again, I'm going to talk about that uh, today. So let's uh, dive in, right? As I mentioned in my first uh, three episodes on innovation, I talked about, I defined innovation as three horizons. So just to recap, Horizon 1 is a short-term innovation, mainly in the core products and large companies like HP or Dell, uh, they do a great job, right? They have some existing products and they're trying to do some incremental innovations on the products for the next quarter, next year, and they do that great, very, very well. They also do well in the Horizon 2s, the medium-term innovation, which is in the in the adjacent offers. Uh, and again, uh, for example, Ansys, uh, we have some software that runs on-premise and we are trying to go to the cloud. Again, large companies do that very well. But where they all struggle is in this long tail disruptive innovations, what I call Horizon 3 innovations. And, uh, and uh, for example, when I was a CTO at ABB, we are developing a software service around digital twins to leverage the ability IoT platform. Those are hard. And so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about in, in today's episode. So the challenge that uh, large companies face, as I mentioned, uh, is that Horizon 1, Horizon 2 did a great job. Most companies struggle with the Horizon 3 innovation. And so the example that I kind of mentioned in the first, in the last episode was uh, when Amazon disrupted the sort of book industry, right, by selling online books, right? Essentially, people used to go to brick and mortar stores like Barnes and Noble to buy a book and Amazon basically made all those books available. And that was a disruptive innovation done by Amazon as a startup. But then Amazon, being a large company, then disrupted uh, they went into on rail retail, right, in the Horizon 2 and sell, sold all kinds of uh, items, not just books. And essentially, Amazon was able to bring in 2 million items on their uh, online website, right, versus only uh, 2,000 uh, or 200,000 SKUs that a, a brick and mortar store like, like Walmart had. And that was a disruption. But then Amazon disrupted again with Amazon Web Services, right? Uh, that was the Horizon 3. Or you look at Apple, where they essentially started selling sort of Macintosh, laptop computers, and so on, uh, the MacBooks, and then they invented, they did a disruption with an iPhone, they did a disruption with an iPad, they did another disruption with the iTunes music stores and all the apps that are available on, on, on the iOS. So those are examples of the Horizon 3s that large companies have made, companies like Amazon and Apple have done. So the question is how, if you are working for a large company, how can you do those kinds of innovations? So uh, before I begin, I want to kind of want to do a very quick review of business basics, right? So we are in a large company and, and, and the CEO of that large company, his ultimate responsibility is to its shareholders, right? And so he has to increase the share price and the market capitalization, the market valuation of the company. So the CEO and the management team, and I am, again, fortunate to be working at ANSYS, right? I work with my CEO and our uh, executive leadership team, and we are responsible for increasing the, the valuation of this company by growing its profits, scaled over hundreds of products, right, across multiple divisions. This is the, the challenge that large companies face. So you're a large company, you have maybe 2 billion shares outstanding with earnings per share of $5. $5 and a price to earnings ratio, PE ratio of about 10. Therefore, the company price per share would be about $50 and the market cap would be 100 billion. That is how a company like, like uh, <clears throat> say, Amazon or, or Google or, or Facebook, right, has those 100 billion to a trillion dollar valuations. So how do they get there, right? So the objective in these companies is to continually increase the revenue, right? In other words, uh, and its profits, right? So you cannot just only increase the revenue, you have to increase the revenue and the profits year after year after year. And the companies that, that whose revenues grow more than 10% every year profitably, right, are the ones that Wall Street will, will provide higher valuations of their share price and therefore uh, large market caps, right? For example, I work for ANSYS as CTO. We are a $2 billion annual revenue company our revenue has been growing more than 10% every year, right? And we are profitable at more than 40%, right? Uh, a net income margin, which is why sort of Wall Street is, uh, is favoring us uh, positively, right? And our market cap is about 20 billion. So the question is, 
many people do not understand this very simple fact that the only way to grow revenue profitably is through constantly innovating with new products or services that are better than your competition and thereby continuously increasing your share of market right and so this is essentially the fundamentals that i'm going to talk to you about very very exciting stuff right so let's kind of give you a, a sort of try to illustrate this one example suppose you are an automotive company right you are you are working in toyota or honda or, or ford or gm right and these companies typically will have multiple divisions right so they have small vehicles like the corolla a medium division like the like the camry a luxury car division like the lexus and, and a truck division like the tacoma or the minivan division like the sienna so you have lots and lots of products each a, each of the products are being made in a division and collectively are generating so much revenue right so just the the small car division right the corolla division may sell a model for maybe fifteen thousand dollars sales projection of 100,000 units in a given year, generating a total revenue of 1.5 trillion. Now, these 100,000 units are sold around the world, right? So maybe 50,000 units in America, 30,000 in Europe, 20,000 in Asia. So the total revenue is it's 750 million in, in North America, 450 million in, in, in Europe, and 300 million in, in Asia. So that is how large companies run their businesses, right? So now, Many people don't understand the simple fact that the only way to grow revenue profitably is to constantly innovate with new products right, and services. And this is the basic principle that I like, I'd highlight. So, so in the case of uh, Toyota, right, its sales of the past five years has been relatively flat. So, so what, I mean, so given this, right, what steps must the company consider to grow its revenue? Um, this can only be done through innovation, right, by creating innovative products that are much better than its competition. And even its existing product line, right? So, so to explain this, I thought I would share with you a, a, a virtual, right? A simple income statement. Now you need to understand that this is the business basics. Right? I'm making many, many um, assumptions here, but this um, income statement is basically saying, hey, I have a car, a, a automotive company. We have four divisions. We make small cars, medium cars, luxury cars, and a truck, right? And the sales prices of those things are 15,000, 25,000, 50,000, and 100,000. And the number of products sold in each category is, say, 100,000 small cars and 50,000 cars and so on. And so you multiply those, that is your revenue, right? So you have 1.5 billion in revenue from your small cars, uh, 1.25 billion in revenue from the medium cars and so on. And then you have the cost of goods sold, right? Which is you have worked with, with the tier one suppliers like Bosch and Continental to get the the, the engines, the, the gears and the steering wheels and the tires and so on, right? So in order to get those parts from those uh, tier one suppliers, you have to spend some money. So the gross margin of that Corolla division is sort of $300,000, right? So the gross margin uh, percentage is a, a 20%. And then you are investing. Each of the divisions are investing, say, $45 million in the Corolla division, $50 million in the Camry division and so on. And then you have sales SGNA expenses, right? Sales expenses of 49 million and so on. And you take all of those, you, you, you subtract it from your gross margin, you're left with a net margin of, of 200, 200 million, right? And then you take, collect it all up, and that's your total uh, net uh, income, right? And the net income as part it generates the sort of, you divide it by the total number of shares, you have, may, have, may have a billion shares. Your income in a given year is $1, right? And your share price is sort of with a P multiple of, of 10 is 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 ten dollars and so your market capitalization of this company is about 9.5 billion dollars this is how now and, and the ceo of this company has to say how do i drive the revenue how do i keep on having the profits to have increased the valuation of the company this is how they invest in innovation right so now let's continue with the example right you are you are this large company you're in this uh, automotive company and most automotive companies they had flat revenue in 2020, right? COVID happened, the entire automotive company went down uh, by 10%. So essentially, what do they do, right? So you are in an auto company, right? You are, you are, you are working at Ford or GM or or uh, or, or BMW or, or, or Hyundai, right? And essentially, you have to grow your revenue in the future, right? So you're not looking only at 2021, you're looking at 2025, 2030, right? So the automotive industry has identified areas like autonomous driving, right? Hey, this is the new area, right? Uh, electric uh, vehicles, right? Moving away from internal com combustion engines into EV, right? And again, companies like like Tesla has shown the 
way for EV, but I mean, companies like GM and Ford and everybody's working on, on electric vehicles and then connected cars, right? Uh, uh, connected cars and shared. So that the automotive industry is talking about case, connected, uh, autonomous, shared and, and EV, right? And so now essentially, while this, the industry is facing a, 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 a slowdown, right? They have to invest in this long term, right? In these areas in order to drive innovation. So essentially, so, so now you have to look at the organization structures of large companies, right? You have a CEO, you have different divisions as a, so the car division, the truck division, the, the minivan division. And each of these divisions, you have lines of businesses, you have small cars, medium cars, luxury cars. And essentially, you have this revenue that is coming in, right? As I said, for the Corolla division and so on. And you have sales that helps sell these products, right? Sales in America, sales in Europe and so on. That is how a large company is organized. So the question is, how do you now drive innovation in such an organizational structure? So the way you do that, right, is by managing a portfolio of R&D investments, right? So, and essentially in these large companies, you have lots and lots of people, smart people who are working in R&D and, and they're working on innovation. And essentially you have to look at these innovation projects that you have, right? You are working on autonomy or you're working on electrification or you're working on connected cars and so on. And they have a portfolio of products and essentially you're trying to see which project should I be investing in and, and how can I increase the investment in, in these projects, right? So this is the, the challenge that a, a CEO of a company or an executive team, management team faces. So let me give you an example of the kinds of, uh, of discussions that happen, right? I mean, as CTO of ABB and Schneider Electric or now at CTO at Schneider Ansys, right? We are always discussing these kind of things, right? So let's imagine you are a, working for a company that has four divisions, right? It's four products. And the products are, which are shown on the right-hand side, right? Uh, in terms that are in four quadrants, right? You have the x-axis is the profit margin percentage, right? So 0% in the center and, and, and right-hand side is more profits. Right, left hand side is negative profits and on the y axis is the revenue growth percent right so the center is zero percent and ten percent twenty percent is the revenue growth every year so this is where things are right so if you look at it and you really analyze it right the blue product is highly profitable right but so it is profitable but the revenue is going down so it's in a declining business so we call this a cash cow so you should the company should continue investing in it right but minimally, you don't put a lot, a lot of money because this is a dying business. It's like the iPod business for Apple, right? I mean, yes, they were making business, but when the iPhone came in, right, that that, that is where you need to invest. The green product is the best, right? As you are in a, in a high profit margin and you are growing profitably. So you need to put all your investment in that area. Then you look at the yellow product, right? The yellow product is a new product. So clearly it is not profitable today, but it is growing, right? It's like in 2007 when the iPhone was just starting for Apple. So you have to keep investing in this new product, right? Which is growing. The red product is sort of not profitable. The business is declining and this business needs to be sort of shut down, right? So the people who are working in that division need to be re-pivoted, retargeted to work on the yellow product, the green product and the blue product. This is sort of how innovation is managed in large companies, right? I just want you all to understand that. So now the question is, uh, you, are, you, are, you are working for a large company and you're working on this electrification of cars or autonomy cars and so on, right? And, and, and you are having all these people who are working on these innovative ideas, right? You need to actually protect your innovation, right? But it's because suppose you invent something in the electrification area, right? And, and you're working for Ford or GM, you don't want your competition to kind of know about these things or take advantage of it, right? So you have to constantly invent in new areas like AI and machine learning or 3D printing or internet of things or big data analytics. In fact, in chapter eight in my book, I kind of talk about the digital technologies that will drive product innovation in the 21st century. But then a key thing that I want to, to understand is large companies and small companies, they're constantly innovating and these innovations need to be protected, right? Um, uh, 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 through patents, right? So what are patents? Patents are a way to say, hey, you cl lay claim to the fact that this is innovative, I invented it, and nobody can sort of copy this exact innovation, right, for the next 20 years. This is how uh, inventions work and patents work. So I just wanted to give you an, a, a, a some idea of some large companies, right? These are global companies uh, and how many patents they have filed in 2020. So IBM filed 
9,400 patents, right? About nearly 10,000 patents in 2020. Very, very innovative company. Samsung uh, filed 8,500 patents in 2020. Then you look at LG and Canon and Intel. And again, we, we, we know that Google is an innovative company. Again, they are all, also they have sort of filed more than 2,000 patents. Apple has uh, filed 2,800 patents. So this is how these large companies are inventing and they are protecting their, their, their IP uh, every year and i work for ansys we again obviously very much smaller company and we file maybe uh, over 100 200 patents uh, per year so this is how uh, we uh, how these large companies are protect are investing in new ideas and they're protecting the innovations so now let me kind of talk about the fact that so i've i've, I've shared that this is the problem the problem is large companies don't know how to uh, support long-term innovation so let me give you some ideas of what large companies can do to support long-term innovation. And there are broad areas. You can start a new, sort of create a central research lab, right? And have a CTO office. And again, as I mentioned, I used to be CTO at ABB, Schneider Electric, worked at HP Labs. That's sort of how those companies um, invested in this long-term R&D. Second is to create centers of excellence, right? So that support horizontal technologies and so on. And I will give you some examples. Third is to organize company-wide technology conferences and talks to bring, to share lots of innovations across all the R&D engineers, right? A, a fourth area is to, to have programs to solicit new ideas from all employees and to fund those innovative ideas. To create uh, institutional programs to recognize innovation, create essentially a culture of innovation. And the final thing is sort of uh, uh, open innovation with startups and academia. And in a future chapter, in, in chapter six of my book and a future episode, I will actually go into that in more detail. And then the sort of future, uh, sort of uh, the episode five uh, in this series, will talk about how large uh, companies can create central research labs. But just yeah, as a summary, let me uh, introduce the concept. So companies like like Bell Labs, right? I mean, AT&T created Bell Labs, or IBM created IBM Research, or HP created HP Labs, Microsoft has Microsoft Research. So in chapter five of my book, I actually go into those organizations and I, I actually interview Peter Lee from, from Microsoft Research about how this is done. This is the topic of my next um, episode, episode five, right? Which I discuss in, in chapter five of my book. But then I kind of talk about how the role of the Central Research Lab has transformed and how you have to support, support, supposed to do say one third short term research, one third medium term, and one third long term research. So again, um, I will talk about it in in the next episode. And then the other concept is uh, is how to create sort of centers of excellence. So let me give you an example at Ansys, right? What we are doing, we have a lot of very big exciting products. We have products around structural products like Ansys Mechanical. We have fluids products like Fluent. We have electromagnetics products like HFSS and, and Maxwell. And then, but each of these products are being driven by technologies, technologies like numerical methods, technologies like, like meshing, technology like AI, ML, and so on. So the columns of the matrix are these technology areas and the rows are the products. And so what we have done is to create centers of excellence at ANSYS, right, is to allow these people the R&D engineers in this large company to collaborate across different products. So that's one way to drive long-term innovation. A second way to drive long-term innovation is to have what we call the side project innovation approach. And this is a very simple concept. The idea is uh, you are working for a company and you're working sort of 100% sort of, of your time on a particular uh, innovative product and so on. And, and you just don't have time to do this uh, truly in, uh, uh, innovative uh, innovations, right? And so what do you do? So some some companies actually, this was started at 3M and it was sort of popularized by Google that every person will have maybe 20% time, right? One work day uh, per week to work on some projects that are totally unrelated to the project they're working on. And the good thing is it creates a, a, a really, it's a morale, build, morale builder and essentially is great for morale and so on. Uh, and essentially it allows everybody right to work on a uh, some truly innovative ideas the disadvantage of this is that it implies that r&d manager which allow anyone right instead of getting 100 percent productivity they're getting 80 percent productivity right and essentially even in those innovative projects right, the people are working 20 percent of the time so it takes five times the time right in terms of getting these innovative ideas 
to market. So again, it's a good idea, but I mean, it has its pluses and minuses. And just, again, you should read chapter four to go into the details. The second approach is an all-in approach where essentially you, you generate a lot of long-term innovative ideas. You ask everybody in the company to say, hey, do you have any ideas? And you collect all those innovative ideas. And then essentially you say, well, once you have identified this thing, you, you are essentially taken away from your normal product team and, for, uh, and you create a, a, an incubation team and they're all working for the next sort of six months to two years on that innovative project. And examples of that, that idea spark that I kind of talk about in my, my chapter, right? This is something that uh, the CEO of Cubic has done and it's a very, very successful program. So I, that's something that I wanted to highlight. The third thing is to just create a culture of innovation, right? I mean, essentially at ANSYS, for example, we have created the CEO Innovation Awards, right? Every year we try to uh, provide like a $10,000 uh, award, right? A recognition by the CEO uh, to, to recognize the best uh, product innovation, the best technology innovation, the best solutions innovation. It's great morale builder. It just creates a culture of innovation. Second area is sort of at ANSYS. And when I was at HP Labs, we organized this company-wide technical conferences like called TechCon, right? And it brings in all the technologies uh, technologies in the company, right? For an entire week. And they sh they, they talk about the, all the innovative things that they have worked on, share it, they have discussions with other, other, other people, their peers, and that fosters a lot of uh, collaborative uh, innovation. And the third thing is uh, organizing some technical talks like called Tech Talks. So we organize these bi-weekly Tech Talks it's by internal people, internal to ANSYS and people from, from professors and startups and large companies and so on, right, to come and give talks on different topics, right, about the future of innovation. And this just is a great morale builder and, and it just creates a, a, a culture of innovation in the company. So I have covered a lot of topics today. Hopefully you have understood, you have gotten an, an, an appreciation of how uh, long-term innovation happens in large companies. If you want to learn more, I invite you to, to read chapter four of the book on Innovation Factory. You can order the book from Amazon as well as from uh, Barnes & Noble. Uh, or you can contact me if you have any questions at pridbanerjee at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening uh, to this episode. Bye-bye.